Chapter 22 All was only just beginning as Kitty and her mother walked up the great staircase, flooded with light, and lined with flowers and footmen in powder and red coats. From the rooms came a constant, steady hum, as from a hive, and the rustle of movement, and while on the landing between trees they gave last touches to their hair and dresses before the mirror, they heard from the ballroom the careful, distinct notes of the fiddles of the orchestra beginning the first waltz. A little old man in civilian dress, arranging his grey curls before another mirror, and diffusing an odour of scent, stumbled against them on the stairs, and stood aside, evidently admiring Kitty, whom he did not know. A beardless youth. One of, those society one of those society youths whom the old Prince Shcherbatsky called Young Bucks, in an exceedingly open waistcoat, straightening his white tie as he went, bowed to them, and after running by, came back to ask Kitty for a quadrille. As the first quadrille had already been given to Vronsky, she had to promise this youth the second. An officer, buttoning his glove, stood aside in the doorway, and stroking his mustache, admired Rosy Kitty. Although her dress, her coiffure, and all the preparations for the ball had cost Kitty great trouble and consideration, at this moment she walked into the ballroom in her elaborate tulle dress over a pink slip as easily and simply as though all the rosettes and lace, all the minute details of her attire, had not cost her or her family a moment's attention, as though she had been born in that tulle and lace, with her hair done up high on her head, and a rose and two leaves on the top of it. When just before entering the ballroom, the princess, her mother, tried to turn right side out of the ribbon of her sash, Kitty had drawn back a little. She felt that everything must be right of itself, and graceful, and nothing could need setting straight. It was one of Kitty's best days. Her dress was not uncomfortable anywhere. Her lace bare did not droop anywhere, her rosettes were not crushed nor torn off, her pink slippers with high, hollowed out heels did not pinch, but gladdened her feet, and the thick rolls of fair chignon kept up on her head as if they were her own hair. All the three buttons buttoned up without tearing on the long glove that covered her hand without concealing its lines. The black velvet of her locket nestled with special softness round her neck. That velvet was delicious, at home, looking at her neck in the looking glass, Kitty had felt that that velvet was speaking. About all the rest there might be a doubt, but the velvet was delicious. Kitty smiled here too, at the ball, when she glanced at it in the glass. Her bare shoulders and arms gave Kitty a sense of chill marble, a feeling she particularly liked. Her eyes sparkled, and her rosy lips could not keep from smiling from the consciousness of her own attractiveness. She had scarcely entered the ballroom and reached the throng of ladies, all tulle, ribbons, lace, and flowers. Waiting to be asked to dance Kitty was never one of that throng when she was asked for a waltz, and asked by the best partner, 
the first star in the hierarchy of the ballroom, a renowned director of dances, a married man, handsome and well-built, Yegorushka Korsunsky. He had only just left the Countess Bonina, with whom he had danced the first half of the waltz, and, scanning his kingdom that is to say, a few couples who had started dancing he caught sight of Kitty, entering, and flew up to her with that peculiar, easy amble which is confined to directors of balls. Without even asking her if she cared to dance, he put out his arm to encircle her slender waist. She looked round for someone to give her fan to, and their hostess, smiling to her, took it. How nice you've come in good time, he said to her, embracing her waist, such a bad habit to be late. Bending her left hand, she laid it on his shoulder, and her little feet in their pink slippers began swiftly, lightly and rhythmically moving over the slippery floor in time to the music. It's a rest to waltz with you, he said to her, as they fell into the first slow steps of the waltz. It's exquisite such lightness, precision. He said to her the same thing he said to almost all his partners whom he knew well. She smiled at his praise, and continued to look about the room over his shoulder. She was not like a girl at her first ball, for whom all faces in the ballroom melt into one vision of fairyland. And she was not a girl who had gone the stale round of balls till every face in the ballroom was familiar and tiresome. But she was in the middle stage between these two, she was excited, and at the same time she had sufficient self-possession to be able to observe. In the left corner of the ballroom she saw the cream of society gathered together. There incredibly naked was the beauty Liddy, Korsunsky's wife, there was the lady of the house, there shone the bald head of Kriven, always to be found where the best people were. In that direction gazed the young men, not venturing to approach. There, too, she descried Stava, and there she saw the exquisite figure and head of Anna in a black velvet gown. And he was there. Kitty had not seen him since the evening she refused Levin. With her long-sighted eyes, she knew him at once and was even aware that he was looking at her. Another turn, eh? You're not tired, said Korsunsky, a little out of breath. No, thank you. Where shall I take you? Madam Karenina's here, I think. Take me to her. Wherever you command and Korsunsky began waltzing with measured steps straight towards the group in the left corner, continually saying, Pardon, Madame, pardon, pardon, Madame, and steering his course through the sea of lace, tulle and ribbon, and not disarranging a feather, he turned his partner sharply round, so that her slim ankles, in light transparent stockings, were exposed to view, and her train floated out in fan shape and covered Kriven's knees. Korzunki bowed, set straight his open shirt front, and gave her his arm to conduct her to Anna Arkadyevna. Kitty, flushed, took her train from Kriven's knees, and, a little giddy, looked round, seeking Anna. Anna was not in lilac, as Kitty had so urgently wished, but in a black, low-cut, velvet gown, showing her full throat and shoulders, that looked as though carved in old ivory, and her rounded arms, with tiny, 
slender wrists. The whole gown was trimmed with Venetian guipure. On her head, among her black hair her own, with no false additions was a little wreath of pansies, and a bouquet of the same in the black ribbon of her sash among white lace. Her coiffure was not striking. All that was noticeable was the little willful tendrils of her curly hair that would always break free about her neck and temples. Round her well-cut, strong neck was a thread of pearls. Kitty had been seeing Anna every day, she adored her, and had pictured her invariably in lilac. But now seeing her in black, she felt that she had not fully seen her charm. She saw her now as someone quite new and surprising to her. Now she understood that Anna could not have been in lilac, and that her charm was just that she always stood out against her attire, that her dress could never be noticeable on her. And her black dress, with its sumptuous lace, was not noticeable on her, it was only the frame, and all that was seen was she simple, natural, elegant and at the same time gay and eager. She was standing holding herself, as always, very erect, and when Kitty drew near the group she was speaking to the master of the house, her head slightly turned towards him. No. I don't throw stones, she was saying, in answer to something, though I can't understand it, she went on, shrugging her shoulders, and she turned at once with a soft smile of protection towards Kitty. With a flying, feminine glance she scanned her attire, and made a movement of her head, hardly perceptible, but understood by Kitty signifying approval of her dress and her looks. You came into the room dancing, she added. This is one of my most faithful supporters, said Korsunsky, bowing to Anna Arkadyevna, whom he had not yet seen. The princess helps to make balls happy and successful. Anna Arkadyevna, a waltz, he said, bending down to her. Why, have you met? inquired their host. Is there anyone we have not met? My wife and I are like white wolves everyone knows us, answered Korsunsky. A waltz, Anna Arkadyevna. I don't dance when it's possible not to dance, she said. But tonight it's impossible, answered Korsunsky. At that instant Vronsky came up. Well, since it's impossible tonight, let us start, she said, not noticing Vronsky's bow, and she hastily put her hand on Korsunsky's shoulder. What is she vexed with him about, thought Kitty discerning that Anna had intentionally not responded to Vronsky's bow. Vronsky went up to Kitty reminding her of the first quadrille, and expressing his regret that he had not seen her all this time. Kitty gazed in admiration at Anna waltzing, and listened to him. She expected him to ask her for a waltz, but he did not and she glanced wonderingly at him. He flushed slightly, and hurriedly asked her to waltz, but he had only just put his arm round her waist and taken the first step when the music suddenly stopped. Kitty looked into his face, which was so close to her own, and long afterwards for several years after that look, full of love, to which he made no response, cut her to the heart with an agony of shame. Pardon. Pardon. Waltz. Waltz, shouted Korsunsky from the other side of the room, 
and seizing the first young lady he came across he began dancing himself. Yeah.